Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Don. I'm an alcoholic. I don't remember it like that at all, but... uh... But thank you for that very kind introduction, and Tab, you are a blessing in my life. And this event, this weekend, has been a blessing for all of us. How nice to be back together. I bring you greetings from Bellingham, Washington. If you don't know where that is, don't feel bad. Uh, We're about 100 miles north of Seattle, 20 miles south of the Canadian border. America's first defense against Canada, I suppose. Uh, And we've been locked down tight. We just got back to face-to-face meetings a couple of months ago, so I'm still a little weird from Zoom and uh, some other things, and it's just nice to be out among my fellows. And uh, i got to tell you, man, uh, this weekend I have had the experience three or four different times to just experience that music of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I like to get in a room like this or where they're having food, and I'll just find a wall in a corner, and I'll just kind of put my back against it, and I'll just get still, and I'll close my eyes. I'll let the music of Alcoholics Anonymous wash over me. Everybody talking. Nobody listening. You know, just that. (laughs) That electric hum, that energy. That when we were new, we walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, we didn't have the vocabulary to describe what we were experiencing, but there was something about the room, something about the light in the eyes of the men and women that greeted us at the door, something about the energy in the room, the laughter that was lifting us up out of our seats, and we go, what have I fallen into? And at the low point of my existence, walking into Alcoholics Anonymous as a new man, when I knew my life would never be okay, when I knew I had a shot at a good life once, but that was in the rearview mirror, your laughter, your love, your kindness, your energy conspired to make me feel like maybe it wasn't over yet, and I had no intellectual reason to believe that when I got here. There's something that happens when we come together like this that is indescribable, yet indisputable. It is a feeling that can't be expressed in words, but we all experience it when we come together. So thank you for that, because I experienced it this weekend, and I've been missing it a lot, and uh, I haven't had enough of it in my life, and uh, I've become the kind of guy that I rely on you. I'm better when I'm with you. You know what I mean? Uh, that's It's really that simple, isn't it? And uh, before I go any further, I, I need to work through a little resentment I have about the raffle. Um, (laughs) two-part resentment first part I had red tickets Um, my brothers and sisters of the red tickets I know you noticed I know you noticed and uh, how many exactly did you win dear that's four you know what I really liked you know what yeah that doesn't count you know what was really yeah. You know what was great? When you won the second one, there was a murmur in the crowd. When you won the third, they started to turn on you, didn't they, a little bit? When you won the fourth, the vote was in. Every ticket they called after that, I've never seen anybody pray so hard not to win. <laughs> She's clutching her tickets going, please, God, not me, not me, not me, not me. That was the highlight of raffle for me. I've never seen anybody that much fear-based about winning. Now, that's very alcoholic to turn to your friend and go, well, she won too. (laughs) Well, now I know how you were as a little girl. Who broke the lamp? (laughs) That's great. And we got some new people here tonight. We got somebody with seven days, somebody with 20 days, somebody in their first 30 days. And if it hasn't happened already, which I'm sure it has because there's good AA here in Texas, I want to cordially welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous and let you know that I speak for everyone in this room, that we are delighted, delighted that you are here. But <laughs> if you are in your first 30 days of sobriety, we know that you may not be so, I don't know, delighted. 
but we've been waiting for you. We know a lot about you. You are us. And I know that's bizarre when you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous. It was bizarre to me. It was kind of insulting and off-putting. When new man would come, I'm the new man, and old timers walk up to me and go, I know right where you are, and I know right who you are. And, and I go, you don't know me. You haven't been where I've been. You haven't done what I've done and all that kind of stuff. But let me tell you, if you're new, we know a great deal about you. For instance, this hasn't been a good year. <laughs> Coincidentally, wasn't a good year for us when we got here. <laughs> but we are delighted that you are here, and we are so excited because we know what's waiting for you. We know that God, as we understand him, has a whole brand new life waiting for you. And we understand when we look at you, we're not just seeing you. We know there's a family behind you. There are children. There are mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, employers, friends. And they're not with you tonight, but they're with you. We see them. We know my family was not with me when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, but bet your bottom dollar they were sitting at home praying for my ass because they'd done everything they could do for me. And I know they took a deep breath when I joined AA. And it was a couple of years before they exhaled and thought maybe he found something. And so I know that I, uh, I wish you the best. I hope that you stay long enough uh, to find what I found here, which was a brand new life. Now, uh, A did not fix my life. My life was beyond repair. There was no raw material to work with. <laughs> See, that's not what we do here. And, uh, and isn't that true? I mean, let's, let's, let's face it. Uh, the good news about Alcoholics Anonymous is and always will be it does not work because of the alcoholic. It works in spite of the alcoholic. Because what do I really bring to the game of recovery when I walk in here, right? Pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization, deep resentment, and fear. <laughs> Wreckage of my past, a lot of old ideas. I mean, there's not a lot of raw material to work with. But AA works in spite of me, not because of me. And that's so important that you know that because if you're like me, you might think that you stayed in the water too long and whatever chance you had at a good life is in the rearview mirror. And that's just not true. There's a power here that you're going to tap into that you can't believe. And in fact, here's something crazy about A, and this is a truth. The worse you are, the more we like you. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm a low-bottom drunk. I was a superstar newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> They love me. They were just excited. And it, it's a strange thing when you arrive here. And I think about my journey to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I have no legitimate reason uh, to, to have ended up in AA. I just don't. Uh, now, i got a story, and I have a narrative, and I have an explanation, and I have an excuse that I carried into AA with me, that if I tell that story just right, hopefully somebody in here will feel sorry for me, which is always my intention when I told that story, and it's about growing up in Hollywood, California, and about my dad getting up when I was two years old and going out for a pack of smokes, and I haven't seen him since. It's about that tough neighborhood, all those gangs, not having a man around to show me how to grow up, having my mom's alcoholism in the house, the physical abuse. See, I can just roll, see, I just rolls off the tongue, and that's because it's well-practiced. I've been telling that story for decades by the time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. But I'll tell you what, if you come to here and you're an alcoholic and a victim like I was, and you want to stay a victim, whatever you do, here's some free advice. Good Lord, do not get a sponsor. <laughs> I don't know where they learned this stuff, but they seem to absolutely delight in destroying victimization. At least mine did. And our program will do that for you. You see, what happened to me is I went through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I got to that fourth and fifth step inventory, and I did what the book talked about, right? I got down in black and white what really happened. And it was astounding the things I conveniently forgot on my way to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I had athletic coaches and teachers and family members that took an interest in me. I had a mother 
that raised three kids on her own, never took a dime of welfare, got us up, got us fed, got us off to school, took two buses to work, two buses home to pick us up from school, to make sure we did our homework, make sure we were fed, made sure we had clean clothes to sleep in that night, and then she did it again the next day, and she did that. She sacrificed her entire life for her children. Yet, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I am filled with spite and rage and venom for that woman that should have been classified as a saint. That is a lack of perception. That is alcoholism. That is somebody that only tells a story that makes me look like the good guy and makes you look like the bad guy. And I don't know any other way to live. And what is behind all that, all that sickness, all that twisted perception, really is nothing more than this, a a desire to protect my right to drink. You see, if it's my fault... If it's not mommy or daddy and all those things that happened to me in that tough neighborhood, you know, I don't have an explanation for why I'm ripping the cover off my life and ripping the cover off your life. I might have to do something about my drinking. So I keep that narrative. You see, that resentment against my father, that resentment against my mother, that resentment against that neighborhood, it's valuable. It's my explanation for a poorly lived life. As I drink myself to death, saying, you don't understand, my case is different. I know what it looks like, but it's really not my fault. Let me explain it to you. Thank God that the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, the inventory process in particular, corrected the only mistake a loving God ever made in this self-centered alcoholic's life. You see, God made with me with my eyes looking outward instead of inward. And all my life, I've had that ability to look out in the world with 20-20 vision and tell you instantaneously with no effort on my part what you're doing wrong. (laughs) Only part of the gift. (laughs) I instantaneously know what you should be doing instead. And I like to share that with you because, well, I'm a giver. (laughs) But where my life is concerned, where the quality of my life is based on the quality of my actions, I'm a blind man in the wilderness. No idea how to live life. And none of that explains how I ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I wasn't born alcoholic. I don't get into that debate, but I know this much. I was born weird. You know what I mean? We all got that. You know, half a bubble off a plum. We talk about not getting the rule book to life. It's a very common theme in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't have to come to AA to learn how to do an 11-step review. Man, I'm doing that at six years old, laying in bed at night, going, why did I say that? I should have done that. I'm never doing the right thing at the right time with the right people. I'm never comfortable in my own skin. These aren't things produced by drinking whiskey. These are things that go away or dramatically reduce with a couple of drinks in my system. And I tried to do it their way. I swear I did. I went to their schools, took their tests, played their sports, dated the right women, and I excelled at all of it, and I did it with guys that excelled at that stuff. I was our graduating class athlete in high school at a 3.6 GPA. I was a guy that was going places. He looked at me, he said, that's a guy with a bright future. But they couldn't see what was going on on the inside. I've always had a good stage character. You know what I mean? I show you what I want so you stay off of me. There's two ways to keep people off of you, right? One is to be angry and unapproachable. You won't have any friends, but they'll leave you alone. (laughs) And the other way is to show them what they want to see and never be real and be a chameleon, right? I drank with the surfers. I drank with the bikers. I drank with the essays. I drank with everybody. I can be whatever you need me to be because underneath all that is a guy that has to have his medicine. And when I was 17 years old, I found my medicine. I got drunk for the first time. Not my first drink, not interested in that. Don't have that date written down. But I can tell you the first time I got drunk. Senior year, 17 years old, with the guys I played high school basketball with, and I had the magic that we all talk about. We all all talk about getting drunk for the first time, and it's some variation on the same theme, isn't it? We all sound the same. You know, I got drunk for the first time, and I felt 10 feet tall, and I felt smarter, more confident, better looking, because they had the courage to do things I couldn't do before. And we talk about it as though it's delusion or fantasy. I'm not too sure. I mean, the big book promises me that every man, woman, and child is blessed with certain skills, aptitudes, and abilities. We'll call these our gifts from God. Your birthright. What if these gifts from God These things you always suspected were true about yourself. You could never really fully make contact with them. That they seem to be just outside of your grasp. Something in AA we like to call potential. (laughs) And then one day something as magical as alcohol came into my system. And let me tell you what, 
It's not fantasy, and it's not delusion. Suddenly, these things I suspected about myself are fully in my grasp. And you put a couple of drinks in me at 17, I'm not, I'm telling you, I am smarter, and I am tougher, and I am stronger, and I am better looking, damn it, and I am more of everything that I hoped I could be. And it's not any more complicated than this at age 17. I discovered that I like the way I feel with a couple of drinks in me much more than I like the way I feel sober. And it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. But that didn't seal my fate. That didn't make me an alcoholic. And that didn't bring me to Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, I got the physical component of this disease. You see, I don't know that if you put any alcohol in my system of any type, it sets off an allergic reaction. I'm in that bizarre 10% of the population where one's too many and a thousand's not enough. And I don't know that. So what does that mean? I'm drinking in ignorance, which means I'm bringing a knife to a gunfight. I don't understand that I have an allergic reaction, something we call the phenomenon of craving, that you light that fuse when you put alcohol in this system. And I should have suspected that there was something different from my drinking from the beginning. Other people drink and they hit a certain point with that, don't they? And they say weird, bizarre stuff like, I'm feeling it. But they don't say it with excitement. They say it with concern. Oh, I'm feeling it. And I'm like, that's what's supposed to happen. <laughs> Keep going. You're really going to feel it in a minute, you know. One of the most bizarre ones, I've had enough. That's one of the biggest lies my mother ever told me. She used to look at me and she'd say, Donald, enough is enough. Really? <laughs> I've never met an alcoholic that followed that rule. But more importantly, I fall in love with the effect produced by alcohol. For the first time in my life, I was doing what I was doing with the people I was doing it with, and I didn't want to be anyone else or be anywhere else. I was self-contained in that moment, in my shoes, and it was perfect. And I didn't know at that moment at 17, my fate was already sealed. On a primitive, almost caveman-like level, I remember thinking, drinking good. <laughs> and I knew I'd be doing more of it. And I didn't plan on going to jail, wrecking cars, breaking hearts, breaking promises, and ending up in Alcoholics Anonymous more dead than alive on September 16th, 1991. That wasn't my plan. You know, I just knew that I liked it. In the early part of my drinking, I got to tell you, it was free. You know what I mean? I wasn't getting any real jams. Didn't have any real trouble in my life. I'm not standing in courtrooms in front of judges trying to explain my latest event of outrageous behavior. You know, all that stuff, all those things that were to happen to me, we can label them yet to be added to my story. And, I mean, I was going up the ladder in business. I'm making a ton of money. I'm dating up a storm. I'm playing sports. Alcohol seemed to the untrained eye to be an additive to an already full life. And I was having such a good time with the drink when I was 23 years old. If God Almighty had showed up in the bar I was drinking in and said, Don, the next drink, the next one, it's going to pass you into a region where there's no return through human aid. You're going to have to go to AA for the rest of your life or die a horrible alcoholic death. I'd have told God Almighty, you got the wrong guy because it's working for me. From the inside out, from my toes to my head, it's allowing me to be anything I want to be, not feel anything I don't want to be. It's magic in a bottle. You can't move me off of that point. It's not a problem for me until it's a problem for me. Now, it may be a problem for other people. <laughs> it may be a problem for my landlord who's not getting his rent, my employer who's not getting five days a week out of me, or my girlfriend I can't stay faithful to. I can't tell you how many times I've had a... A lovely woman standing in front of me, crying her eyes out, going, don't you know how I feel? And I'd be like, mm, not really. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember saying to one girl, listen, I'm drinking, and you're watching, and one's more fun than the other. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish that the pain that other people experience, both emotional and physical, as a result of the actions I take when I drink was some stimuli to me to change. But it's not. There's no power there for me. And trouble starts to come into my story. And trouble comes in like a thief in the night. It doesn't kick down your front door. It just enters in. You get a little scrape here and there. It's so easy to brush it off, isn't it? You wake up in jail. And you're in a blackout. You don't remember being arrested. And you're mortified, aren't you? My God. You think to yourself, I got a good job. I make good money. I was a graduating class athlete. I got a nice car. I don't know where it is, but I got a nice car. <laughs> 
And you think to yourself, I'm not the wake up in jail type of guy. <laughs> and you look at your associates at the drum tank and you go, I am not like these people. Missing the point that you are with these people. And, the, <laughs> and I remember thinking, this will never happen again. The shame and the remorse and the guilt and the embarrassment. But I'll tell you what, you come out of a blackout in a jail cell for the 10th time, it's a completely different vibe. Well, this is jail. (laughs) Oh, I recognize it. I don't know which jail. And you wonder what you did, and you hope you're not in too big a jam. And alcohol, through failure and repetition, will beat a guy like me down to a place where I now live a life where I accept the unacceptable. I ended up living the kind of life at the end that if you put a normal, mature, healthy person in my life for half a day, They go running down the street in terror. Yet for me to become Tuesday, come Friday night, become Monday morning. Remember Monday morning, the oops, I did it again morning? Had such good plans for the weekend. It's not going to be like last weekend. And you don't live that way for a week or a year. You can live that way for a decade because I did as I spiraled down to the bottom. And trouble is my story, I mean, that's not a big problem for a drunk like me because my alcoholism seems to keep pace with the consequences it produces, right? Gives me the two best friends that drink and drunk ever had, justification and rationalization. And what does that sound like? Well, you got to be able to go to jail. And when you get out of jail to face the people that love you the most and want the best things in the world for you, you got to be able to look them in the eye with a smile on your face and a laugh in your voice and go, well... <laughs> Everybody goes to jail once in a while. (laughs) No, they don't. No, they don't. I've been sober 30 years, man. I've talked to a... It's shocking how many people I've met outside of our little club that have never been to jail. I stopped asking. It's embarrassing. uh, (laughs) My alcoholic life seems the only normal one. You don't believe me? Let's play a game. Just a little game tonight. Show of hands. How many people have ever been handcuffed? Just raise your hand. (laughs) Oh, It's worse in Texas than I thought, you know. (laughs) There's a couple of things you have to realize about what just happened here. Number one, when you're in AA and somebody asks that question, this is what we think. Well, that's a dumb question. Of course I've been handcuffed, you know. (laughs) That's number one. Here's the other thing. I need to to let you know if you haven't thought about this. You don't get that reaction at the Rotary Club. (laughs) Or the church knitting circle, right? <laughs> Don't go to work on Monday and hit your coworkers up. Hey, you ever been handcuffed? They'll move away from you. I mean, <laughs> my alcoholic life seems the only normal one. And by the time I know I'm in trouble, it's too late. 25 years old, the light goes on. Every negative aspect of my life right alongside that is a drink of alcohol. And I get it. They've been talking to me about my drinking for years, and I get it. And I say, this is this must stop. I can't go on this way. I wasn't raised this way. There's enough failure and pain and heartache in that short 25 years. It should be enough information for a guy like me to realize I'm not doing this very well. And I made the alcoholic declaration. I didn't come to AA, and I didn't get a sponsor, and I didn't get a home group, and I didn't work your 12 golden steps and work with others or any of that nonsense, you know, because I'm a man. You know what a man does when he has a problem with something? You just knock it off. I I made the alcoholic declaration. I'm quitting drinking. Don't try to tempt me. And I knew it would be no big deal. And I quit drinking without Alcoholics Anonymous, thank you very much, for two weeks. And... uh... (laughs) Now, the problem with that is in that short two weeks, the outside stuff that they can see starts looking better, doesn't it? Laundry starts getting done, starts showing up to work five days a week, which was kind of new for me at that point. And I'm getting all the affirmations and all the attaboys you think a guy like me would want who just made a life-changing decision to quit drinking. Oh, we're so happy, Donnie. We were so worried about you. We thought you were going to die. It's all going to be okay. And boy, don't I don't want to believe that. Don't I want to believe that, that it's all going to be okay? But with every day that's going by since my last drunk, I'm getting more irritable and restless and discontent. You know, that's right in the doctor's opinion in the front of the big book. Describes what happens to a guy like me when you separate me from alcohol. I become irritable, 
restless and discontent. Now, that is the biggest understatement in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because when you read that, it doesn't sound half bad. It sounds kind of clinical. Irritable, restless, and discontent. I mean, can you imagine if I show up at a meeting one night and my good friend Danny's there and Danny goes, Donnie, how are you doing? Well, Danny, I'm glad you asked this particular evening. I am a tad bit irritable, restless, and discontent. And what's Danny going to say? Oh, no, click your heels and say the third step prayer. You'll be fine, you know. Because <laughs> that's not how it feels. I'm irritable. <laughs> I want to hurt you, you know. <laughs> I'm restless. Maybe I'll go over there. Nope, I don't like them. Maybe I'll go over there. Nope, they don't like me. Maybe I'll get some ice cream. God, I'm getting fat. You know, just... <laughs> It doesn't matter what I'm doing or who I'm doing it with. I'm with the wrong people doing the wrong thing. I can't find my place. I'm like a dog circling his own tail looking for the right place to lay down. Nope, nope, nope. You know, I just... <sighs> and I'm discontent. I used to think discontent made it, meant happy or unhappy. You know what I mean? Oh, no. It's far more powerful than that. You know, we talk about things to kill alcoholics, right? Car crashes and whiskey, but we all know it's discontent, right? And here's the problem with discontent. It's a spiritual condition, which means when I'm truly discontent, it doesn't matter how good it is on the outside, right? It doesn't matter how much money I make, how many women I sleep with, how many people tell me I'm doing well, we're so proud of you that you're sober now, how, how much I'm going up the ladder, but none of it can touch the inside job if I'm truly spiritually discontent. And I don't have an answer when I'm there. Now, the good news is when I am spiritually content, it doesn't matter if I lose a job, she leaves, a health problem, reversal of fortune. The serenity needle doesn't have to move because the inside job is in place. You see, when we're talking about discontent, we're talking about spiritually how we are on the inside. And when I hit a place with untreated alcoholism where I'm discontent, it doesn't matter what I do on the outside. I can't fix the inside turmoil. I'll give you my definition of untreated sober alcoholism. I have a complete and utter inability to experience joy in a sober state, regardless of the outside circumstances of my life. You know what we do better than any class of people I've ever met? We do wrong really well. I mean, we do crisis. We are children of chaos. I mean, oh, my God, give me something. Break my heart. Fire me. Give me a bad medical diagnosis. For God's sakes, give me something I can point my finger to and go, that's why I'm screwed up. You know what makes us crazy? I've been eight, nine years sober laying in bed at night, and all my dreams have come true. I'm active in Alcoholics Anonymous, sleeping next to me peacefully is a beautiful woman who's my wife, Eileen. I got no money problems. I paid all that dough back. I'm out of trouble, but I'm disconnected from God. And I'm laying there in bed, and I'm thinking, all my dreams have come true, and if it was any better, I'd go in the backyard and shoot myself. And how do you explain that to them in Alcoholics Anonymous? How do you explain it to them when everybody's looking? I understand this untreated alcoholism that we talk about that we think is something that happens to you when you're new and you work a couple of steps and you skip down the road of sobriety. And what we find out when they say one day at a time, they're not kidding. Today's the day i got to work the program. They say that cute stuff it means, I can't stay sober today on yesterday's program. You don't know what that means till you try to do it. <laughs> and then you'll know exactly what it means. Untreated alcoholism is available to me right now. All I got to do is start running the show again. That's all I got to do. So I'm on my way to Alcoholics Anonymous. Troubles enters my story, and I start doing everything that you read about in Chapter 3. Various vain attempts to control and enjoy my drinking. Brief periods of recovery, followed always by a still worse relapse. A feeling I was regaining control to find out I'd lost even more control. Pulled the big geographic. Left L.A. L.A. must be my problem. Moved to Boston. Found out, much to my chagrin, they drink in Boston. Huh? <laughs> And I got to tell you what, man, my drinking went off the rails in Boston. This went off the rails, you know what I mean? And things started happening to me. I started getting weird behind my drinking. And I remember one night, man, I was just, the weird. The first mistake I made by moving to Boston is I found out they don't sell liquor on Sundays. That was number one. Number two, the liquor stores closed at 11. And I thought, this is a horrible miscalculation on my part. And on a Saturday night, I was in a club, and I looked at my watch, and it was 1030. 
And I knew Saturday nights are important because you got to buy enough to get through the night and have some for the next day. And that's essential. So I beat feet out of that club and I got to the Cappy liquor store and I bought myself a couple of fists, one to get the job done that night and one for the next day. And then I called a cab to get home and the cab picked me up, pulled up in front of my apartment. And at that point, I burned my life to the ground. I'm drinking to die and I'm drinking to live. And the cabbie pulls up and goes, it's right here. And I got filled with a terror inside me that I can't explain to this day. And I could not get out of that cab. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I was afraid to be alone in that crappy apartment one more night drinking that cheap whiskey. I don't know if I thought there were monsters in there. I don't know what it was, but I told that cabbie, I said, can we drive around for a little bit? He says, it's your money, buddy. He goes, where do you want to go? I go, head towards downtown. And now we're in downtown Boston, and I'm watching the meter go by, and every time it hits 20 bucks, I slip him 20 bucks. And I go, just keep driving. And I'm pulling on the whiskey in the back seat. And then by this, the intercom, you know, his dispatch is checking in with him. They're going, what's going on with that fare? And he's like, it's okay. He's just looking for something. He's making up excuses for me. And 10 minutes turns into 20 minutes and turns into half an hour and turns into 45 minutes. And the terror won't leave me, and I'm drinking the whiskey, and I'm slipping him $20 bills because I can't go home by myself. And I don't know what's happening to me, and I feel like I've gone crazy. And finally, the dispatcher is concerned. He goes, man, do I need to call the cops? Are you okay? And the cabbie lowered his voice because he didn't want me to hear. He didn't want to hurt my feelings. And what he said to dispatch as quietly as he could, he goes, it's okay, man. He's just a lonely drunk. And it went through me because I knew it was true. And I knew I got into a place with my drink, and I, I never meant to get to. I was just trying to have a good time. It made the pain go away. It made anything possible. It fired my imagination. I liked that version of myself with a couple of drinks. And now I'm a guy that can't get out of a cab and go into my own apartment. I'm 6'5", I'm 280 pounds, and I'm scared. I'm scared of everything, and the whiskey's not working anymore. And that was in 1986, and I didn't get sober till 1991. And let me tell you what, I didn't take that ride alone. For the next five years, I took my family on a hellish ride that we call alcoholism. And the only thing that they did wrong is they loved this alcoholic. They were damaged by the wake of my alcoholism. They stood too close for too long next to this guy, and we all got sick together. I left Boston after three years when I wore out my welcome, and I ended up back in L.A., and I got the best job I've ever had in my life, not just drinking, the best job I've ever had in my life, because I'm an alcoholic, and we are like cats flung outside a second-story window. We'll land on our feet, boom, in a three-piece suit and a job interview, you know? And, <laughs> and we'll get the job. We can get the job, get the girls, get the money. We just can't keep any of it. <laughs> Great getters, terrible keepers. <laughs> And you know the rest of the story. You do a great job for them. Then they make a mistake of telling you what a great job you've done. And then that alcoholic translator in our head goes, you should slack off. And we go, that's a great idea. And uh, <laughs> the old behavior comes in, and I'm showing up drunk, and I'm missing work, and I get fired from my drinking. And I play the victim card, and I call up my sister in Simi Valley, California, and say, they threw me away after all I've done for them. <laughs> and I beg, a, I beg an opportunity. I beg a chance. Can I come stay at your place and get on my feet? And my beautiful sister says, you can come stay with me, but if you drink, you're out of my house because everyone knows I'm a drunk by this time. And I told my beautiful sister, Patricia, who I love as much as anyone on the planet, I won't drink, I promise. And you need to understand, when I said that, I wasn't lying, but I didn't understand there's no room for the truth where alcoholism is concerned. And you see, if you love a guy like me, and you watch me get sober to get drunk to get sober to get drunk to get sober over the years, you're going to come to one of two conclusions. One, I'm a liar. But I already said I didn't understand. Every time I quit, I meant it. It was the truth. I didn't want to do it anymore. It wasn't any fun. There's no room for the truth where this game is played. And the other conclusion you might come to is he's really not trying very hard. Not trying very hard, really. Don't you think I have a front row seat for the destruction of my life? Do you know that I'm present for it every day? Do you think I wanted it to turn out this way? Do you know what it's like to wake up and it's in the room with me every morning? That thought, not tonight, God, not tonight. 
yet I'm drunk most nights. And you don't think I'm trying. Who tried harder than we did? And I go into that house and I bring my alcoholism. I start to tear that house apart. And they're getting sicker and I'm getting sicker. And I got an unemployment check and uh, a couple of days before I got sober and I rode up with my brother-in-law, Larry, and I said, Larry, I got my unemployment check and I borrow your car, go cash my check. And he asked me a weird question. He said, Don, you can borrow my car, but will you be coming back this time? <laughs> it was a <laughs> fair question. And uh, I had borrowed his car a few times that summer and gone on vacations and... Uh, I'm an alcoholic at 12 and 12 says my outstanding characteristic is defiance. And when Larry said that, I got right in his face. I said, Larry, how dare you? <laughs> you know, the last time this happened, I apologized. <laughs> Dear Lord, Larry, I opened my heart to you. I don't really need this crap. <laughs> and Larry, untreated al that he was, felt terrible. He took the keys out of his pocket, and I snatched the keys from this man who I'm mooching a room off to get in his car, and I remember thinking, there better be gas in it. Oh, oh like you're so much better. <laughs> oh, I never did anything like that. Oh, I'm sure you're all cut up with your financial amends to your family. Just let that one percolate. <laughs> I go down to the liquor store to cash my unemployment check because that's where drunks of my type cash their unemployment checks. And I have what the book refers to as the thought that precedes the first drink. It's always the same for me. What's in a half pint, right? That's what I always think. What's in a half pint? Nobody ever got drunk drinking a half pint of whiskey. Nobody ever went to jail drinking a half pint of whiskey. And I get the half pint and I drink it and you know the rest. Bought another half pint, drank that, thought I can be to the valley and back in 45 minutes. They won't even miss me and I'm gone. Three days later... I'm driving up the hill to face that family I'd done over one more time. Once again, I've taken their hope, their faith, and their trust, and I've torn it to shreds. And driving up the hill to face that family, I love them no less than I love them at this very moment. And I love my family tremendously. But I can't serve two masters. I only got time to serve one, and that's king alcohol. And you get between me and a drink, it's nothing personal. I'm getting, I'm getting a drink. Going around you, through you, over you. I'm manipulating you. I'm telling you what you want to hear, but bet your bottom dollar I'm getting to the drink. But here's the problem. My family doesn't understand alcoholism any more than I do. So I can't warn you. I can't say, listen, I love you, but I'm going to do it again. I didn't mean for it to happen this time. Do you kidding me? I remember what happened last time. I had the best of intentions. I don't want to treat you this way. You mean the world to me. You're going to have to save yourself. You need to get away from me. But I can't warn you because I don't know what I have. So what do I have to offer? I'm sorry. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean for it to get away from me. I don't mean to treat you this way. And in light of the way that I treat my family, those words are so hollow. They're so inadequate, woefully inadequate in light of what I bring into the family. But it's all I got to offer I walk into a house that's been devastated by the disease of alcoholism to find out they got in a big argument in my absence. My brother-in-law wanted to report the car stolen, and my sister negotiated down to a missing persons report, and the police have been called, and they're on the way up to do the follow-up investigation. Now, I have warrants for my arrest in two counties, so I start yelling at my sister, you know I got warrants, I'm going to jail, thanks for nothing, because now it's her fault. <laughs> I go outside to wait for the police because I don't want the interview to go on in front of the family. I have no idea what I will be saying, but I know I'm going to be lying. You know what I mean? So I'm out there smoking a cigarette, and here comes the black and white. And on the side of the black and white, it says canine unit. And I think, beautiful. He brought the dog. Like I'm in any shape to make a run for it. And, uh, <laughs> And the cop got out and started doing what those trained professionals do. They ask you those hard, tough questions like, uh, where were you? And everything I remember is illegal, so I'm lying to the cop. And he's looking at my eyes really hard, so I don't like that. So I break his gaze. Now he's breaking with me. So now we're dancing and interviewing. And, <laughs> and my hands are getting wet. I just don't feel good. I want to divert his attention. And I see the dog in the back seat, and I point at the dog, and I go, so is that your partner? And he goes, well, yes, it is. And he opens the door, and this dog gets out. German Shepherd, not a hair out of place, like a Rin Tin Tin reincarnate, just beautiful dog. And he started to relay facts to me about the dog's life. 
dog's past mandatory retirement. They haven't retired him yet because he's too good. The dog has participated in more arrests than any dog in the history of Ventura County. The dog has participated in more arrests and rescues than any dog in the history of Ventura or Los Angeles County. This dog was so phenomenal that the officers took a collection out of pocket to send him over to Europe for international competition where he kicked butt on German, German shepherds, right? (laughs) And I remember saying to the cop, I go, that's a phenomenal dog you have there, sir. And this thought flew in the back of my mind. The kind of thought, the minute you think it, you want to deny it, but you know it's the truth. And what the truth was is this dog had done significantly more with his life than I had done with mine. And, uh, <laughs> and man, I hated that dog. <laughs> and, uh, I finished up with the cop. I didn't have to go to jail. I walk into a house that's been devastated by the disease of alcoholism. They want me gone. And they should have wanted me gone. But I'm an alcoholic, and I'm not too proud to beg, and I beg, man. Academy Award performance, waterworks, please, I got nowhere to go. I'll die out there. Please, you got to give me a chance. And they didn't, And out of my mouth comes, I'll go to AA and everything. <laughs> this moment, I don't know why I said that. Because the day before I got to you, I wasn't thinking about you. I didn't really know anything about AA. I heard it was a place that some people stopped drinking at. That's all I really knew. And it's not like my family really believed I was going to go to AA. My first week in AA, my sister drove me to AA and picked me up from AA. You know, it makes you feel when you look the way I look and you get in your older sister's compact car at the end of an evening of Alcoholics Anonymous and she's driving you back to her house, her 31-year-old loser brother. (laughs) So, Donald, what'd you learn in AA tonight? You know, just... (laughs) And I don't remember my first night in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't. You know, I was detoxing pretty hard. They, te- they assure me I was there and I was entertaining. And, uh, but I can't tell you what was really going on that night. But I remember my second night. This was the most important night of my life. And I attended the 6 o'clock meeting at the Simi Valley Alano Club. The meeting ended at 7.30. There was another meeting at 8 o'clock. I had a half an hour to kill before that meeting started. And I did not look that night the way I look tonight. I got hair down the middle of my back, and it's filthy because I don't shower anymore. I got a full beard with food stuck in it. I've lost the ability to speak the king's English. I communicate in a series of hand gestures, grunts, and clicks. I wear my sunglasses at night. I got my tough guy radar out. I got my arms folded across my chest, and I'm rocking back and forth looking at the room. And I don't have my arms wrapped around my chest because I'm a tough guy, and I'm keeping you up. It's because I feel like I'm going to explode from the inside out because I'm physically addicted to alcohol and I'm coming up on 48 hours without a drink and every molecule of my body is screaming in unison, let's go get a drink. And I'm leaving Alcoholics Anonymous. But I'm not leaving AA because it doesn't work and I'm not leaving AA because God doesn't exist and I'm not leaving AA because there isn't help here. I'm leaving AA because I've lost the power of choice where drink is concerned. You see, I have an obsession of the mind beyond my human power that demands that I get another drink if I don't have a solution, and I don't have a solution coming up on 48 hours without a drink. And i got to go, and it's going to cost me everything. It's going to cost me the last person on the planet that will have anything to do with me, my sister. It's going to cost my place of residence. And more than likely, it's going to cost me my life. And that's a small price to pay if I can make the madness in my head go away for just a couple of hours. And I've always been willing to pay that price. And I caught a break. Because although it's the most important moment of my life, over in the corner are two good members of alcoholics named Lou and Mark. And whether I live or die is going to be decided in the next few minutes. But for Lou and Mark, it was a Tuesday night. And Lou and Mark were where they were every Tuesday night, hanging out between the 6 o'clock and the 8 o'clock meeting at the Simi Valley Alano Club, drinking that AA coffee, telling those AA war stories. But more importantly, these good men had their eyes trained on the door and had their eyes trained on the room. And they were looking for men to 12-step. And the way they tell the story is they saw me, and Lou turned to Mark and went, whoa. (laughs) And Mark looked at Lou and went, yeah. And 
And Lou said, well, we probably can't get him sober. And Mark goes, well, we are here. And then they took what I believe is the most important action we'll ever take in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. These two good men walked 30 feet across an AA clubhouse to cordially welcome a man to Alcoholics Anonymous who was dying from the disease of alcoholism. And they did it in the kind and unassuming way that we're taught to do it. Hi, my name is Lou. This is Mark. We don't think we've met you. Why don't you come sit with us? You see, the reason that's so important to me, it might have been 30 feet for Lou and Mark, but for me, it's a million miles. Don't you know where I've been, what I've done, who I've hurt? Don't you understand I can't get my eyes off of my shoes? You want me to go shake hands? You want me to, what are you, insane? I've got nothing in the tank. My scorecard reads zero. No, they understood the terms of engagement for recovery from alcoholism, that they would have to carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. And they sat me down with a half a cup of coffee. And Mark sat with me, and Lou continued to stand, and Lou clapped me right in the middle of my back, and he said, Don, this is Mark. He'll be your sponsor. And in that moment, my life changed. The most important moment of my life. Yet, if you had come to me and said, you just had the most important moment of your life, I'd have said, what happened? I missed it, you know? <laughs> but here's the facts of the situation. My first sponsor, Mark, was an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, which means what? I'll be an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous if I'm willing to have it. Because he's an active member, he has a home group, which means I'll have a home group if I'm willing to have it. He has commitments in AA, tethers, he calls them, things that tie him to the program and keep him from floating away, which means I'll have these commitments, these jobs, these tethers, if I'm willing to have it. He's engrossed in the big book and the literature of Alcoholics Anonymous. He believes that's where the recovery is. He's a big book carrying to the meetings, highlighting and writing notes in the margin kind of an alcoholic, which means I'm going to be a big book guy if I'm willing to have it. He's got a thousand friends. He knows all of you, right? Which means I'll have a thousand friends. I didn't understand that when you get a sponsor in AA, you inherit all their friends. I want to be clear, when you're new, (laughs) this does not feel like an asset. Uh, (laughs) What it feels like is there's a lot of strangers up in your business, you know what I mean? Why am I so fascinating to you people, you know? And, <laughs> and I got to tell you what, man, I sat down with my first sponsor at the low point of my existence, and he took over because he knew the path of recovery, and he knew I didn't. You see, I would have talked a lot. I had a lot of opinions. I'm the guy in the book. I got moral and philosophical convictions galore, but I couldn't live up to them even if I tried. And he knew that because he knew a drunk when he saw a drunk. And he started telling me about himself. He started telling me about his drinking. He started telling me about what it was like to live as an alcoholic. And when he told me his story, he told my story. And what happened is the magic that holds us together, one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic that we call identification, started busting out the walls that I I put up all those years of drinking that nobody knew the trouble I've seen. Nobody's walked the path that I've walked. And suddenly a man told my story when he told his, and the identification knocked those walls down, and I was intrigued, and I was able to hear for the first time what another man was saying about his drinking because I knew he had been where I had been, he had done what I had done, but he wasn't doing or living that way anymore, and I didn't know how he did it. And without my permission, I might add, he got a meeting directory of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he started circling the meetings I'd be attending in Alcoholics Anonymous. How do I know that? He said, uh, these are the meetings you'll be attending in Alcoholics Anonymous. And and I remember thinking that was an awful lot of circling, you know, and, uh, and he's talking about AA, and he's talking about his life, and at one point he stopped and he said, are you working? I said, no, I'm uh, currently unemployed. More circling, more circling, more circling. (laughs) And then he insulted me. Because when you start sponsoring somebody, it's important to get off on the right foot, you know. And, uh, and, And he says to me, he goes, do you think you can go home tonight and not drink? It's kind of rude, isn't it? You know, I'm... I'm coming up on 48 hours of sobriety, for God's sakes. And it (laughs) kind of pissed me off. And I, so I kind of snapped at him. I said, listen, buddy, any idiot can go a day without drinking. And he goes, oh, you're going to be perfect for our program. (laughs) (laughs) And he started asking me stuff about myself. 
And because of a short conversation, I love it in the book that says, having found this solution, being sufficiently armed with facts about ourselves, we can genuinely win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a couple of hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. But if that confidence is established, it's astounding how fast it can happen. My first meeting with this guy, and I told him stuff about myself I was so ashamed, so embarrassed, had so much guilt about. But because he told me his story, it felt okay to tell him about the trouble I was in. And not only that, it's his reaction to it. His reaction. And I got the first clue when he asked me if I was working, and I said, no, I'm currently unemployed. And he said, oh, that's great. (laughs) If you're out in the real world and somebody goes, oh, what do you do for a living? You go, I'm currently unemployed. They'll be embarrassed. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean anything by it. I'm sure you'll get a job soon. And they'll try to get away from you, right? (laughs) But in AA, he said, great. You know what he thought? Good. He can go to more meetings. That was his first thought. I know it was. I know who this guy was. Good. Nothing between him and sobriety. Good. No big job to save. Good. No big shotism. Good. Maybe he's broken. You know, we like it when you're hurt. (laughs) I start telling him facts about my life. He's getting excited. Oh, you're 31 years old? Okay. You live at your sister's house? Of course you do. You don't. (laughs) You don't have a car? Why would you have a car? Oh. Oh, you have warrants for your arrest in two counties? You're an overachiever, you know. <laughs> oh, you owe the IRS $80,000? This just gets better and better. And, and I know, and I start to feel better about my wreckage, you know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you what, he got me busy in Alcoholics Anonymous, busy. Took me through all three sides of the triangle simultaneously, unity, service, recovery, and never told me that's what he was doing. Because that's not how we do it in AA. We don't tell people what to do. We don't dominate. We don't lead from the front. Big Book tells me I commenced my journey shoulder to shoulder with the new man. He'd say, Don, I'm just a drunk that hasn't had a drink today. I've been here a little longer than you. I'm just here to show you the ropes, man. It's your experience. But you're invited. You see, he he used the ancient spiritual principle of the invitation to save my life. It's an ancient principle. We invite the newcomer into our life. So he invited me into his life, into his car, into his relationships, into his friendships. He invited me. He included me in the business meetings and everything. He didn't wait for me to get well to invite me or say I was worthy. I was worthy that day. And he used the invitation because when you use invitation, you leave the new man or woman with a little dignity. A little self-esteem of the right kind. He'd roll up and he'd go, Don, i got, I got to set up this meeting early tomorrow. i got to tell you, can you show up early? I could really use your help. And I'd think, wow, he needs my help. I'd go, yeah, sponsor anything for you. And I'd show up early. We'd set up some little meeting. We'd get done. He'd shake my hand. He'd go, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Let me tell you something. I've been some places before AA. I accomplished some stuff. I don't know why that meant more to me than any of it. He'd roll up on me. He goes, listen, we're forming an ad hoc committee got some problems with the correction, carrying the message in the jail, and I know you know a lot about jail. And uh... (laughs) He said, we really like you on the committee. We could really use your input. And I think, God, I got the AA just in the nick of time, you know. (laughs) And you drew me in, man. You drew me in with your kindness. You drew me in with your enthusiasm. You invited me as an equal. I'm a new man standing in my wardrobe at the low point of my existence where I walk across the threshold into the real world and the real world will look at me and go, you're a failure, you're a loser, you're a shame and a blight on your family. But in AA, you treated me as an equal, regardless of how good your lives were. I felt so bad about my trouble. And I whined, I whined and whined to my sponsor, just always complaining about my life. And every day I'd have a problem. He'd go, Jesus, Don, because you think too much about yourself. If I thought as much about myself as you think about yourself, I'd go hang myself. He goes, Get, you know, why don't you stop sucking the life out of the room? There's a new guy over there. Go over there and talk to him. Welcome him. Get out of yourself for five minutes. And I'd be fine. And I'd, just, I'd be bitter. <laughs> he won't talk to me about my problems if I don't go act like an AA member. So i go act like an AA member so I could whine to him. And I'd walk up to some new guy. I'm Don. I don't think we've met. You're welcome. <laughs> 
He go, I'm Ralphie. I hate this. I go, me too. And he said, you know. And I'd have like 52. I'd have like 52 days, and Ralphie's got 15 days, man. So I'm an old timer to Ralphie, and the, but Ralphie's got a sponsor. And he, I hate my sponsor. I go, me too. And we start talking about our our sponsors and how much we hated them. And I'd have a new friend in Ralphie, and I go back to my sponsor, and I forget what I wanted to talk to him about. I want to tell him about Ralphie. I started to discover the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous and getting out of yourself. That's the best I ever felt when I wasn't thinking about me. Here's a little insight. I'm 30 years sober. I got a really good life. In AA or out of AA. People that don't know anything about alcoholism might look at my house or my wife or my business or many aspects of my life and they might say, wow, that AA really works. No, no damn thing about Alcoholics Anonymous. It ain't that stuff I'm excited about. Right? It's the relationship I have with the guy in the mirror. It's the bounce of my step and the glint in my eye. It's the knowing that I don't care what comes down the pike. I know I'll be okay if I'm with your people and I have a relationship with my God. I'm going to be fine. My experience tells me that. It's indisputable. Up to this moment, standing here in front of you, I can't deny I've made it. Why do I think tomorrow is going to be any different? Why do I have such little faith? Why do I complain about the things I complain about? Why am I a guy that if the newcomer version of me was to show up now and listen to the things I complain about some days, he'd kick my butt. You know what I mean? But it's alcoholism. It's not alcoholism, it's alcoholism. It's got to be treated on a daily basis. And I learned that when I was new by getting out of myself and finding that freedom. My sponsor took me through the, th through the steps and they had the de desired effect, right? I had a spiritual awakening, which meant I was asleep. And I woke up to what? To the fact that there's a power that runs this thing and it's available to me right now. and always has been. And always has been. That's big news for a guy like me. I did not know what I was looking for, I was looking with. And I know that. I used to go to AA meetings and wonder why they made me feel so good. You know, I, I go in there with the whole world hanging all over me. You know what I mean? It's hanging all over me. And I'd walk out a couple hours later, I'd feel good. My problem's still in place, hadn't been solved, but suddenly I wasn't worried about it. How did I think about it? What is it? Is it the people? Is it the people? No, they're not that impressive. Is it, <laughs> is, is it what was said that night? No, same old hey, hey stuff. And it used to make me crazy. And one day I'm reading the book with a new guy. And we're in that we agnostics. And it says, deep down inside every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by pomp, by circumstance, by worship of other things, but in the final analysis, it's only there that he may be found. And the new guy's having problems with it. He's like... What's this idea, idea of God? What do you mean by that? I said, okay, forget idea. Think of it as light. How about deep down inside every one of us is the light of God? And he goes, well, that I can wrap my head around. And, and you know, it's one of those things, sometimes you say stuff, you don't know where you get it from. You know where you get it from. It ain't from you. And I'm thinking about it later, and I'm thinking, you know, when I'm not with you and I'm out there in the world, I've got light. I've got God's light with me. But I have only have my light. But then I come to AA, and guess what? You're there. And guess what you bring? Your light. And sometimes I sit in a meeting with you, and all of you have your light, and I get to tell you, it's so bright in here, I can barely see. And it's a feeling. It's palatable. I can feel the energy when we come together because there's so much God in the room. It just makes me feel that much better. And my sponsor took all of those problems I had in AA, and he immediately put them in the service in Alcoholics Anonymous. I hated the fact I held the IRS 80 grand. Listen, if you got you got a half a million in the bank, shut up, write the check. But when you haven't worked in a year and you go back to work and you're working for minimum wage as a laborer on a framing crew and you've never worked with your hands before and you have a nickname on the job site, the bleeder. <laughs> <laughs> And you enter into a payment agreement with the IRS to send them a hundred bucks a month, and you write the first check, and you think, "Oh, good, seventy-nine thousand nine hundred to go." And <laughs> you know it's never going to be okay. And I'd whine to my sponsor, "When am I going to feel better about this?" He go, "I don't know, Don. Someday." And that's what they tell you when they don't have an answer. But he put that crap in the service, you know, because he knew there's a propulsion system for untreated alcoholism. Right? It says we're driven. 
by a hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, and self-pity. Any one of those things can kill an alky. You put them together, it's a deadly cocktail. And we will not tolerate self-pity in Alcoholics Anonymous. Why? Is it because we don't have compassion? No, we're the most compassionate people I've ever met. Where else are you going to find this kind of love that one drunk has for another? Where you can show up at the low point of your existence, burn every bridge. People find out everything there is to know about you, good and bad, yet they still love you, accept you, and encourage you. Where else are you going to find that? No, we're we're the compassionate ones. But we know self-pity kills drunks. Pour me, pour me, pour me another drink, right? So my sponsor put that stuff in the service. For the next couple of years, any newcomer that had the audacity to complain about their little $1,500 IRS debt, my sponsor would be like, hold that thought, Jimmy. Hey, Don, you got a minute? (laughs) And I'd walk over like an idiot, and he'd say, Don, tell Jimmy how much you owe the IRS. (laughs) And I'd look at Jimmy, and I'd go, I owe the IRS (laughs) $80,000. And Jimmy would go, Jesus, and uh, and I'd say, I just want to be a service, and I'd walk away. And, uh, and Jimmy would feel better, my sponsor would laugh, and, and you taught me to laugh at my problems. And you told me that they were just temporary as long as I was willing to take some action. Years later, I called up the IRS to see what my balance was, and I found out that I had paid them off. In fact, I would overpaid them by 400 bucks. And they said, do you want us to send you a check? And I'll tell you, if you've sent every spare nickel you have to the IRS for about six years, your answer sounds like this. <gasps> you bet your ass. <laughs> called up my sponsor that day, and I said, remember when you told me I'd feel better about this someday? And he, and he said, yeah. And I said, today's the day. And uh, <laughs> And some amends are like that, right? You know when you're going to feel better about it? When they're complete. It's my experience. And so I kept walking down the road in Alcoholics Anonymous, and good jobs became better jobs. And I had more money to pay back the IRS. I didn't have more money in my pocket. My sponsor told me, he goes, I don't worry about it. They don't want your money. I go, they don't? I go, no, they want their money. And (laughs) Where do sponsors get this crap, you know? It's just... But I'm going to AA all the time, man. I'm in AA 10, 12 meetings a week, man. I'm going up the ladder in business again sober, man. I'm making a lot of money. I'm paying back the IRS. I meet a girl named Eileen, right? We fall in love. Boy meets girl on the AA campus. Last June, we celebrated 25 years of sober marriage, man. Just like, oh, man, we're real alcoholics too, man. I'm telling you. Thursday, I'm going to catch a red eye to come here. I had my hand on the suitcase. We had to get in an argument. That's just what we do. You know, I'm, I'm, an hour, I'm an hour from the house on the phone making amends, working the thing. I don't know how normal people do it without the tools, right? And by the end of that conversation, a lot of positive things came out of it. I have a great marriage to a sober woman, and we use the tools. We don't worry about the dust-ups. The big book talks about that. It goes on the distance, clouds form, and you get all scared, and it happens, oh, my God, we're fighting. And I'm like, ah, oh, that woman, how did I end up with you? And, you know. <laughs> but if you use the tools, you come out of that with a different plan. You come out, and my wife and I have a good plan. We want to be better to each other. I remember years ago, I heard this stupid exercise on it. Listen on the radio, and it was, it was a marriage exercise, and I thought, oh, man, that sounds kind of like an AA thing, right? Kind of like 10-step work. So I come home, and I go, honey, we do this exercise with me. It's really simple. She goes, sure. And I go, yeah, on a scale of 1 to 10, rate me. Give me a number. She didn't hesitate. Had a number like that. It was not the number I was thinking of. <laughs> so I controlled my facial reaction. And I said, if I am perhaps a... Seven, as you say, how would I become an eight? And uh, man, she had an answer for that, right? Didn't even have to hesitate, right? She said, well, be nice if you looked at me when I was talking to you. Now, here's my intellectual reaction to that. Well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I look at you when you talk to me, but I'm trying to get along, be a better husband, be a good AA. I said, well, you know what? I'll make that a spiritual piece of business. Thanks for sharing. About two weeks later, we're on the couch, and she's talking to me about what? I don't know. She's going on and on and on. And uh, <laughs> But I remember this exercise, man, so I'm locked in, man. I'm locked in. 
Uh huh. Really? Then what did she say? Mm. And uh, and all of a sudden, man, my head starts to tremble, and I start to go over here and I grab my head and bring it back. And I swear, I hit a point where I would rather look at the blazing sun with naked eyes and continue to look at my wife when she talked to me. And I went, "Oh my God! If I'm this wrong about this, what else am I wrong about? Everything." And here's the point I want to make. I can't get to where I'm going without the people I'm in relationships with. You know, I used to be confused about marriage, the mystery of it. Women are so mysterious. What do they want? What they... Never realizing all the answers I needed were contained in the woman that was peacefully sleeping next to me in the same bed every night. I just never thought to ask. But it doesn't stop there. What about my employer? What about my employees? What about my friends? What about my sponsees? i got to tell you, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid to find out the truth about myself. And I've also come to the conclusion I can't get there on my own. I will not write another inventory and find out anything new about myself. I just won't. I know myself as well as I'm going to know myself. I know too much about myself. But I don't know about the missing pieces. You see, I can't see myself. I'm telling you, once a month, I meet with my boss, I have a cup of coffee. It's always the same conversation. How am I doing? He goes, oh, you're doing great, Don. We couldn't run this place without you. You're the straw that stirs the drink. Yeah, 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 I know I'm great. Is there anything I could be doing that I'm not doing currently? Oh, Donna, you know, I couldn't ask you to do any more. Just answer the Yeah, and he's always got an answer. And it's never anything I would have thought of. And it's always a small adjustment that makes me more valuable, makes him happy, makes me feel more useful. I ask my wife those questions. What I... I remember asking my wife, is there anything I could be doing? And she, this is, this you gotta be careful. My wife one time said to me, she goes, she goes, listen, I don't want to start anything, which is wife code for I'm about to start some stuff, right? <laughs> and she said, she said, do you ever plan on making the bed? <laughs> We've been married for 20 years at this point, just like five years ago. And men have been asked this question in the history of time and, and uh, I think I gave the dumbest answer in history, though. I'm kind of proud of it. And uh, I said to her, I go, well, I thought you'd like making the bed. <laughs> <laughs> I really did, you know. <clears throat> and she said, nobody likes making the bed. And if you're spiritually fit, this is how fast a 10th step can work. I said this, would you like me to make the bed? And she said, that'd be great. And I'll tell you what, next time you meet my wife, or some of you know, you can ask her, if, if she's not in it, I make the bed every day if I'm at home. And it's no big deal. The adjustment's like that. And I have no problem making the adjustment. I think we all want to be better people. But the thing is, I would have never got there on my own. So I talk to my sponsees. I talk to my employer. I talk to my wife. I talk to my friends. They say, how am I doing? What could I be doing better? And the adjustments I have to make are very small because I can't get that information on my own. And I can't execute it without God's love, grace, and power. 17 years ago, my wife decided she didn't want to live in L.A. anymore. <clears throat> she wanted to move to the Pacific Northwest. She wanted to live someplace beautiful. And all my arguments were about money and money and money. And I heard myself. And uh, we took a leap of faith and we moved to Bellingham, Washington. And it was crazy, man. We're like, we're like footwork is free people. I mean, we moved up there without jobs, without a plan. We just sold our house in L.A., bought a house in Bellingham, and said, we'll figure it out later. Found there was AA in Bellingham, got plugged in immediately. I mean, we hit town Thursday night at midnight, and that Wednesday we are in an AA meeting. You know what I mean? Went to meetings every night for years in Bellingham to get plugged into the AA community. And we're, you know, it's, it was this culture shock. I mean, it, we're, we're city kids, you know what I mean? We're concrete, steel, and glass, and suddenly we're eight miles out of town. It's 150-foot trees and, like, deer in your yard every day and wildlife. And, and at night, it's dark at night, man. It's like darkity-dark-dark, dark, you know? And I, <laughs> I remember the first time I, like, forgot something out in the driveway, and I walked out there like an idiot to go to my car, and I didn't have a flashlight. And I got about halfway to my car, and a little voice in my head said, Cougar. And I just jumped up in the air and just... <laughs> I run in the house and slam the door, and my, my wife's like, what's with you? And I go, don't go out there. It's darkity-dark-dark, dark, dark, you know? And, and we, got, we got wildlife, man. We got deer in our yard every day. And, like, we lost our minds because we're city kids, man. For us, like, wildlife is like a squirrel. And suddenly, 
It's summertime, and the deer are bringing their baby fawns into the yard. And I mean, if anybody needs 20,000 pictures of a baby deer, just see me after the meeting. And, and this one mama deer kept showing up, and she had this little boy fawn with her. And he was like, I fell in love with this guy because he was like really inquisitive and brave. He'd run right up to you and then run away. And he had this big scar across his face, man. And I, so I made up a story in my mind about I got in a fight with a buck defending his mom's honor and got plowed in the ground. I identify with that. And we're city kids, so we name them. You know, it's Mama Deer and Scratch, Mama Deer and Scratch. And, uh, and then we're having a good time. We're getting adjusted to the area. And then rutting season comes in the fall, and the deer start taking off their summer coats and putting on their winter coats, you know, but not Scratch. Now, this little boy deer, you know, he started looking, I don't know, kind of ugly. His fur started looking patchy, and I, I mentioned it to Eileen. I go, is it me, or does Scratch look kind of rough? She goes, no, he's looking rough. And my wife is like that girl, man. And she gets on the Internet and researches it, and reports back to me. It's an actual affliction they get. They get it in their first year. It's called hair loss syndrome for these deer. And if they lose enough of their fur, right, winter will come, and they can't eat enough to keep their furnace going. They'll get hypothermic, and they'll die. And I go, Scratch is going to die? She goes, yeah. And I go, not on our watch. And, uh, <laughs> and we lost our minds, man. And we broke every law in the books for Washington's and wildlife management. You know, we're doing supplemental feeding. We're setting up feeding stations. And when you do that to feed a sick deer, you can't feed the one sick deer. Man, we got like 27 deer in my backyard, right? Got full-grown bucks, you know. My wife is out in the middle. She's chasing 120-pound bucks out of our backyard. You're selfish. You're self-centered. Let the sick one eat, you know. And then, <laughs> Where am I? On the deck. Be careful, he's huge. <laughs> you know. My wife is fearless and uh, and it's not working, man. He's losing more and more fur. I'd go to work. I'm obsessed with this baby deer. Did you see Scratch today? Yeah. How's he doing? Not good. And I shake my fist at God. Not this one, God. You don't get this one, right? And, uh, and finally it's winter time, man, and this poor little deer, he's lost all the fur in his body, except a two inch wide, two inch high mohawk that goes from his neck all the way down to his rump and we've overfed him so now he's fat rounded out like a beer keg <laughs> he just stands in my backyard this sick newcomer mohawk deer <laughs> just eating and pooping and uh and i'm obsessed with this guy and he and he makes it to spring and he doesn't die and for the next three or four years, every rutting season, he'd come down from the high country with the other boys. He'd show up in our backyard, and we knew it was him because of the scar. And he'd walk right up to my wife, and he'd eat apples from her hand. And I'd watch that. And I'd think to myself, what was it about that damn baby deer that made me lose my mind? One day it hit me. I'm that baby deer. I'm that newcomer in the Simi Valley Alano Club with my back against the wall that anybody with a glancing familiarity with alcoholism, would have looked at me and said, you see that guy, that guy over there? He's going to die. And two good members of Alcoholics Anonymous saw the same thing and said, not on our watch. And they did what we do. And they gave me that spiritual first aid. And they invited me into Alcoholics Anonymous. And they pulled me into the middle. And I want to tell you this. I know this as much as I'm standing here right now. It's our watch now. And why we've been in here this weekend, safe, sane, and sober, enjoying the gift of sobriety, having some laughs, feeling the love and the fellowship, sharing with each other, celebrating our recovery. They're out there on the streets tonight, and they are dying. And more importantly, they're coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, and they don't even know it yet. And they're coming looking for us. And they're going to arrive the way that we arrived, hopeless, helpless, hapless, not knowing what else to do, knowing this thing isn't going to work for them in a million years. Yet when our new friends that we haven't met yet arrive in our respective home groups, the question we have to ask ourselves is, where will we be? And more importantly, how will we be? Am I going to be hanging out with my friends talking about fishing and fantasy football, my latest business deal, and where I'm going to go on vacation, the state of the nation, and COVID, and all this crap that I've seen drift into Alcoholics Anonymous lately, stuff that has no business leaving the parking lot? Or am I going to be like Mark and Lou, drinking that AA coffee, telling them AA war stories, my eyes trained on the door, my eyes trained on the room, looking for men to 12-step? See, when I go to AA now, it's just another night in AA for me. Another link in a long chain of undeserved gifts. I take it for granted. I don't mean to, but I expect to be sober. I know how to do this thing. And I come to AA sometimes forgetting that that's my story. But for someone else, 
This might be the most important moment of their life. And I don't want to be the guy that misses it. I don't want to be the guy that walks by the newcomer. But here's the problem, man. I go to AA and I got the whole world hanging over me. I'm in the real world, right? I work for a living. I'm out there slaying dragons. And sometimes I show up in AA and I just got my problems hanging all over me. I got my money problems. I got my sex problems. I got my health problems. I got that stuff that sometimes we get. I got no business getting out of the truck and walking into an AA meeting. I'm not spiritually fit because I'll walk right by the newcomer. Get a cup of coffee. I need a little time to download. I need a little me time. I want to find my friends. I want to find Tad. I want to find Danny. I'll tell you how tough my life is. And maybe then after that, after I get my chair and my coffee, maybe then I'll go shake some hands. But I need a little me time. And I'm not ready to go to AA. That's not what we do here. But I'm not that good. And I'm not that moral. And I ain't that spiritual. So I have to pray. I have to ask God for help. Prayer is a method of asking my Heavenly Father for things I don't have naturally. And I don't have that naturally. I'm too selfish. So I don't get out of the truck. And I always say the same prayer. God, I'm at AA and I got the world hanging all over me. Please let me leave these things in the front seat. I know you'll take good care of them until I come back. Give me eyes to see and a heart to feel. Let me remember it's another night for me, but it could be the most important night of somebody else. And then I meditate on what I would look like if I was really grateful for this gift. Doesn't take long. Maybe a minute. And now I'm ready to go to AA. Bouncing my step, glint my eye. I'll work the whole room. Shake hands with everybody. I don't think I've met you. What's your name? Jimmy? Jimmy, it's so nice to meet you. I'm glad you're here. How much time you got? That's amazing. That's great. Drums can't stay sober that long. That's beautiful. Hey, why don't you meet some of my friends? I go take Jimmy with me. Now Jimmy and I are talking to welcome in everybody. But guess what happens when I do get my coffee, do get my seat, and I sit down? I don't need to download anything. I've never been better. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> just, when I'm, just when I'm being spiritual. <laughs> So my prayer for us tonight is we stay sober forever, but we never forget, right? We're Alcoholics Anonymous. Sobriety is a gift, but it's a gift that comes disassembled. And this is the place where people learn to put the gift together, right? That's what you did for me when I was new. You gave me this gift. You laid these tools at my feet, but you didn't walk away. You stayed and helped me put it together. That's my job. Show them how to put it together. They're coming to AA. They're looking for us. I hope we're ready. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.